Hello, everyone, and welcome to RevMD Sex Bites Podcast with me, your host, Dr. Deborah Durst. So today we're going to talk about lichen sclerosis and give you some facts and some new regenerative treatments for that. So I have some guests with me. I'm going to let them introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Meredith Wallace, and I've been with Dr. Durst for about year and a half year and eight nine months now <laughs> it just keeps adding up right <laughs> so i am one of the skin specialists there do mostly lasers a little bit of everything so happy mm-hmm. to be here hello my name is faraday Golombieski. i am a family nurse practitioner and uh, i do a lot of the wellness stuff and some of the procedures but i stay away from the lasers that's for these laser <laughs> ladies <laughs> hi i'm marissa state and i'm a laser technician and medical esthetician Thanks for having me. All right. Well, so lichen sclerosis is what we're going to talk about. And so, again, we do this more from the wellness, sexual wellness side. So mm-hmm. Meredith and Marissa um, don't often see this and hear about it. So we always want to talk more in depth about it and so that everyone knows. And mm-hmm. so lichen sclerosis, what is it? Again, so some might have heard the condition, but some, again, it's a long diagnosis, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. So maybe early on, it's a gynecological skin disorder. So basically, mm-hmm. in the perineum, which is, you know, the outside area of your you vagina, know, vagina and anal yeah. area. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Bulbo vaginal. <laughs> Medically there bulbo. There we go. Medically bulbo vaginal and <laughs> layman is what? The vaginal and anal area. (laughs) There you go. So it can be all of those areas. Skin, it's a skin condition, can be inflammatory, but could be autoimmune. But the issue is, is, you know, what kind of symptoms would you have? And so you have pretty vague symptoms early on, and that's why there's such a prolonged diagnosis with some, in that it could just be redness, it could be a little irritation, um, maybe some bleeding, a little bit of discomfort. Ulcerative sores Mm -hmm. in some severe cases. You can have tear. Um, pain with urination, pain with intercourse. Um, Mm -hmm. So it can be pretty debilitating in more severe cases. And it's regressive. So that eventually could be the case, you know, and so then it would be more obvious that you're looking for a diagnosis, but early on, maybe recurrent infections that you're not giving a um, specific diagnosis for. You know, I hear that a lot from women. You know, I keep going. I don't have any, you know, specific. Irritation. Yeah. A couple oh. times a year, maybe. No big deal. And then it this, becomes more frequent. I keep this vaginal discharge and infection. And it's really not a vaginal condition. It's external. Yeah. So it may not be discharge that you have, but because your external area is irritated, sometimes you'll get more frequent urinary tract infections. You know, but so it can be pretty vague early on, a little bit of redness, you know, again, just pain. So anything that's bothersome to you, that's recurrent, consistent, then that's when you want to bring it up to your gynecologist just to make sure yeah. that's not that an infection. Aware. So women that have had a UTI or have had um, vaginitis or any of those normal with vaginal bacterial discharge, issues, yes. it's not a, like Dr. Durst said, a issue with that. It is skin. So yeah, I just it, want to reiterate, it's a skin uh, disease process. It does not involve the vaginal canal. So you're not going to get that discharge um, and recurrent discharge. You know, and again, frequently with women as we go through perimenopause and menopause, you know, because our um, the insults that the vaginal canal can, can mm-hmm. um, handle, such as orgasms and, you know, ejaculation and products and cleansers become very limited in what you can use because of pH issues. And so they'll get vaginal infections. And that's a frequent cause. That's not what we're talking about. This is an external skin. So you just wanted to make that clear. But again, diagnosis can be, you know, pretty delayed. Exactly. So um, when you look up this condition, a lot of the research says that it's very rare. Mm -hmm. But um, in 2020, the International Journal of Women's Health said that actually women that go and see a gynecologist that specializes in diagnosing this, that it's a lot more common than we think. It's um, actually being diagnosed in one in 70 women. So that is a very large number when this is a condition that is widely known to be a rare disease process. So unfortunately, that just means there's a lot of women that are suffering in silence with this or have been improperly diagnosed or are writing it off until it becomes so severe that somebody has to do something with it. So it is diagnosed by exam 
it is and symptoms, but the final diagnosis really comes from biopsy. So um, in the more mild symptoms, a biopsy is really your definitive that this is what it is. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's really interesting when you start kind of looking at the data, that same article um, in that journal said that some women, that when they look at the time frame of symptoms to diagnosis of the disease process, that it's a five to 15 year period um, delay for most women, which mm-hmm. is sad. Mm-hmm. Too much time. Yeah. Well, and I think the issue is, is because it can be very vague early on. And again, because it can also be vague in um, appearance externally, that it's not picked up on early on and not biopsied early enough. And so when it becomes obvious, then it becomes obvious. And exactly. now everyone's biopsying it. So I think if you're not getting answers, again, general gynecology, you know, as this study shows and data shows that like sometimes that's not the best they're not the best at picking up on the diagnosis early on. And so if you have recurrent symptoms and complaints and you're not getting answers, then maybe look for a specialist in, you know, vulva vaginal, you know, area or ligand like sclerosis specifically just to rule out that as being a, an issue because it does increase your risk of vulva vaginal cancers, you know, and, and likewise early diagnosis is good you know, because there's lots of regenerative stuff we can do as well. So so traditional medicine typically um, starts with a topical steroid cream mm-hmm. for treatment. And that is the gold standard. Um, and it, it does help. It helps decrease that inflammation. But in our practice, we look at more regenerative stuff. We're looking for something to um, fix the basis of the problem. Let's get down to cellular level. Let's actually make consistent change to stop this reoccurrence. Like I said, corticosteroids are helpful, but they have lots of side effects. So you can have thinning of the skin. You've got to be careful where you're putting it, how much you're using, and you have to use it frequently. So the other portion of that is for it to be effective. You have to be compliant on the directions and how often you're using it, and you have to actually do it, which is hard when you're using a steroid cream every day or months on end for treatment, you tend to not be as compliant. Um, So in our office, we have quite a few different ways that we can approach that. Well, and again, so traditional medicine is going always with medicines and, and, and surgery. Faraday and I always point out, like, again, you know, layman terms and medical terms and then traditional versus non-traditional because it does break down to the fact that you go to traditional doctors and you get traditional solutions, which are medicines and surgery. No surgical options really that are going to improve this condition, but uh, medicines such as steroids will improve inflammation. Again, what are the causes? It can be inflammatory, can be hormonal imbalance, can be autoimmune. autoimmune. It could be previous trauma to the area, you know, as an inciting event. So there's lots of different things. But inflammation, again, is the root cause of lots of illnesses. And so obviously an anti-inflammatory mm-hmm. steroid would be helpful and it and is that's, helpful yeah and it's, it's helpful. not the only option yeah not <laughs> the only option and again there are at there are downsides to steroids and that goes with steroid use across the board you know if you're using it systemically and joints all of that eventually you get skin breakdown in this area if you're using it on a daily basis and so mm-hmm. what are our other options and so again that's where we come into play and that's where we love what we do because regenerative medicine gives you options that we can give the body back what it needs to repair itself and sometimes even look at root causes. So PRP, yeah. you know, being one of the options, which we love PRP. And I'm sure you can use yeah, everywhere. We just use it about everywhere. Right? There's nowhere you can't use PRP except your eyeball, maybe. Exactly. And that's about it. Um, for now. Yeah, for now. <laughs> but platelet-rich plasma, so again, uh, we're drawing blood, spinning it down and getting the platelets and a concentrated form of platelets. And platelets have growth factors in them. Again, we're re-injecting them into an area to communicate with stem cells in the area to regrow tissue, whether it be nerve, blood flow, collagen, elastin, Mm -hmm. to basically repair and regenerate and improve cell health. If your arm is cut and your platelets go to the area, they're going to stop the bleeding and regrow arm. So there's going to the growth factors in the platelets will communicate with stem cells in the arm, so you don't regrow your scalp or your vagina on your arm you know you're going to regrow arm so the same thing happens when we're re-injecting platelets into the vaginal area and it's actually the vulva like the labia minora and majora so Um, all external injections Mm -hmm. so and it's very 
painless. You know, we're going to do some blocks because we've been doing PRP injections for a mm-hmm. long time. And again, we love them. And we know ways to, to make it more comfortable. So exactly. We'll do some topical. We'll do clitoral blocks and, um, and make the injections a more comfortable procedure to have done. And so sometimes even using PRF, too, because it is an external soft tissue condition, so you can use it there, too. So that is one of the things. And then there's studies. There's some studies that show, again, small amount. Small. They're very limited. So when we're looking at studies and you're looking at large studies, those Mm -hmm. are usually backed by big pharma. And so when we're doing stuff like PRP, there is no medication to sell. There isn't anything to be patented. It's your own blood product that we're using, spinning down and re-injecting. So what better to use than your own body's resources? So a lot of these studies are very limited. Um, In that journal, that International Journal of Women's Health, um, the article last year discussed a couple different studies with platelet-rich plasma um, for treatment. And it was a study of 15 women. And out of those 15 women, all 15 had improvement in symptoms. So small study. So when you have a lot of small studies, they can't make recommendations for treatment based on these unless they are double-blinded or larger populations. And um, But that is objective. That is not a subjective thing. That right. is women that are seeing improvement. They had pain during intercourse. Now they're not. They had, um, you know, ulcerations. They are not. They had the redness and the itching and that is repaired. So these are um, resolution of symptoms. So there was another study with 30 women. Again, they're very small, but women are having improvement and seeing improvement with PRP. You just can't ignore that. You just can't ignore it. You can't sweep it under the rug. It's happening and it's useful and it's making improvements. And especially when it's all patients. And then there's a lot of case studies as well or case reports where they'll have... um, a biopsy proven histological improvement and so again complete resolution of symptoms and improvement of the epidermis and dermis with PRP okay. and so again we'll deeper dive into this with a later podcast but now just going over kind of the general causes of it you know and some other alternative treatments for it. So laser is another one. You know, there's some studies there, again, small, regenerative. So if you don't have big pharma supporting studies, you're not going to get big studies because you don't have that financial support. And so when we're talking about more natural treatments, that happens. And then traditional medicine is 10 years behind anyhow. So even once you had good studies, and we're seeing a little bit of that right now. So it takes 10 years for traditional medicine to catch up with you know studies have put it into practice so there's lots of delay and and patients don't have time for a delay and if it's something that they. hasn't shown adverse effects and doesn't have a downside to it and can regenerate so you know they're more proactive than providers in finding solutions to a condition that's only really given medicines that could have adverse effects so Absolutely. to me it's if you look at medicines and surgeries you're always going to have you know, some advantages and disadvantages. And so you're going to have the same with regenerative methods. But in my opinion, really no risk involved because PRP procedures have really never shown to be risky or have complications. And it's your own blood and growth factors repairing tissue. So, and earlier diagnosis or symptoms is, is best. And again, we don't do biopsies in our office. We're You know, we're basically treating a condition that's known to be there, but we're not diagnosing it. Exactly. Most of the women we see have already been diagnosed, have been Mm -hmm. on other treatments, have done the steroid cream for years on and off, and they're looking for another option Mm -hmm. because it's still occurring and surgery isn't an option. And they've Googled something online or stumbled across something and coming in going, is this really an option? Mm -hmm. Am I really going to see improvement? And we're fortunate enough in our practice to see that, to see those differences, which is really exciting for us as providers Mm -hmm. um, to see change. Yeah, especially when someone feels hopeless. You know, it's it's nice to be able to provide that. Correct. And so lasers are another option um, for that. And so lasers... Um, are going to heat all of our lasers that that we use for this purpose are Mm non-ablative so they're not going to ablate tissue remove tissue from the surface but they're going to heat and stimulate basically tell the injury the tissue it's injured as well and to repair and so um, it's regenerative likewise and there's been again small studies but no adverse effects you know no pain with treatment 
And so again, just more studies needed in both the areas of PRP and lasers, yep. but very promising in patients. Um, there's forums that you can actually get onto that for patients that have had PRP procedures and even laser treatments, and they'll talk about them and the effects. And, and so that's a great option for patients that have a diagnosis to get on and yes. talk to other patients with diagnoses and get potential experiences with regenerative treatment. So absolutely. And those lasers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Some of those lasers are ablative. Some are non ablative, um, meaning that some will have some downtime or some do not. So we do non ablative treatment. So we use Mm -hmm. um, radio frequency to heat the area to tell it there tell the body that there's an injury versus removing layers of skin to tell the body that there is an injury. So there is definitely differences when you're online and looking up these treatments Mm -hmm. to look for. Um, But we always like to hear about your guys' experiences. So Mm -hmm. please share in our comments. Um, If you have questions we haven't touched on or you'd Mm -hmm. like to know more about, always uh, feel free to put those comments in. We Mm -hmm. love reading them. We love seeing them. We will always touch back on them. And And never know who you might be able to help just by stating you know your experiences or somebody that you know that might be having that experience because mm-hmm. that's that's an issue people just don't talk about it because it's uncomfortable to talk about yeah so yeah. you never know who you might be helping by just speaking up so that's yeah. what we're here for well and i think in general sexual wellness is an uncomfortable area it's an area of vulnerability that people do not want to talk about so again our office is awesome at making people feel comfortable. We want you to be open. Mm-hmm. So likewise, if you message us or you comment and you have anything that you want to have addressed in the future, we're more than willing to talk mm-hmm. about it. Just a few clarifications before we go, because again, we're doing more of a general like in sclerosis and we will kind of look at studies a little bit more because there's other treatments that we might be able to talk about in the future, but it can happen with prepuberty, can mm-hmm. happen with men. Um, and again, otherwise it's postmenopausal is the usual, again, a prolonged diagnosis. It could be those recurrent, you know, redness, irritation, even bleeding because they'll have fissures or cracking of the skin yes. and pain with sex is one of the things that you can commonly find. And again, you might get thinning of the skin eventually, some mm-hmm. white looking areas, so whiter a in waxy appearance. look more wrinkled, waxy, all of that. And so autoimmune inflammation can be vague, prolonged diagnosis. And so again, if you have anything concerning that you don't feel has been addressed or diagnosed, then try to find somebody that specializes in vulvovaginal or like in sclerosis, just to rule that out as a diagnosis. Some other things that might uh, be on topics uh, or at least included in podcast with this in mm-hmm. the future is, you know, could food potentially be a source of that? Because all diseases start with inflammation. And so looking at the GI tract and things that can cause that is there are there food allergies do you have a leaky gut are you getting inflammation we have one cell layer of the gi tract and so again if you're eating the wrong stuff and you're not having regular bowel movements and your gi tract gets inflamed then you'll get stuff in your system that causes inflammation Mm -hmm. and the next autoimmunity and this is part of it we haven't seen a lot of evidence of that but we want to dive a little bit deeper and see if we can find anything And then would peptides work? You know, some of those peptides like TB4 or TA1 um, that help with inflammation autoimmunity are those things that might potentially, or even BPC. BPC, I forget. You never know. Anything that decreases inflammation and repair. Yeah, so those are other potential. And even, you know, could those potentially, or has anyone even thought about injecting those locally into the area? You know, again, if we don't have much in the way of studies for PRP, we're not going to have much in the way of studies for that, probably. But Faraday and I are probably going to dive Dig a in a little bit more and see if we can find anything because we like finding solutions. And again, as long as there's not a downside, sometimes trying something that we think might be beneficial is is a good thing. So yeah. and I think in, out there in this podcast, particularly, and we've run into it before, but getting ready for it, you know, we kind of sit down, we're looking for articles and it was really hard to find a lot of support outside of their traditional gold standard this Mm -hmm. is it so we'll definitely be digging in a little bit more and trying to find um some support for the -hmm. food you know possible effects on that or um more information on prp it's good to have this open door policy for women to feel comfortable to really ask the questions any question yeah no. And you ask I the question, that, we can find, try and find an answer. And there are some forums, again, with lichen sclerosis. But likewise, 
OSHOT is the PRP procedure we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And there's some forums, even if you did OSHOT and like in sclerosis as a Google search, you'd find some forums as well. And then you would find their experiences with it. We'll put some links in general, some general stuff on lichen sclerosis in the um, in the bio or whatever it's called in the body. Yeah, the area the under the video. The area under the video. <laughs> has that yeah. Location. Yeah. You know, yeah, wherever and that is, somewhere in there. Somewhere. I know it sounds good, right? Any questions, any experiences, you know, that you have, let us know. We would love to address things, and we're willing to deep dive into anything sexual wellness. Yeah. Thank you all for sitting in and and giving me input and and again just opening the forum for women to talk about anything that might be bothering them. Just remember we're here to revitalize your look, your health and your sex life and we're willing to deep dive into anything sexual wellness. So let us know what you want to hear next.